I'm going to read from Ephesians 2, uh, verse 1 till 10. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show um, the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You can be seated. We are today continuing our message series in the book of Ephesians. Last week started with uh, chapter 1, and today, guess what? Chapter 2. This is part 1 of chapter 2. We'll read uh, part 2 of chapter 2 in uh, just a minute. And so this is also a message that is kind of in two uh, the message, part two of the sermon series is in two parts. There's a uh, part one based on what we just uh, just read, where we read about the, uh, where we hear about the implications of grace as they are working themselves out in our own lives. So this is very much about how uh, God has saved us uh, more on an individual level. And then part two will look more at how that happens at a more communal level, how, it's, uh, how that means something, how the implications of grace go beyond just individual salvation, individual this experience of grace and how it transforms. It goes further than that. It goes to the whole church. And so we'll reflect a little bit on, the, on what that means and what that looks like. Grace reforms you and me to live as the new humanity and then... We will also look at how grace reforms us at a communal level to live as the renewed people of God. So first, the renewed humanity. This is a process that's going from death to life. People under grace have been made alive again. And Paul phrases it so powerfully. He says, but God rich in mercy... Because of his great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. See, the way that we approach history as sort of B.C., before Christ, and then A.D., which is um, Anno Domini, the year of the Lord, sort of before Christ and sort of since Christ, this is how we approach history in the same way we can approach our lives again. There's a time before Christ... And there's a time since Christ. Since Christ has come into our lives, we are different people. Before we were dead, now we are alive. That's quite a contrast. That's quite a contrast that's drawn here. Before you were alienated from God, you were dead in your sense. You were in the dark. You were under oppression. You were under wrath even. But now you are reconciled to God. You are alive in Christ. You are in the light. You are living in freedom and you are under grace. Someone say amen. <laughs> I, just, I, I don't need personal confirmation for my words or something. I'm not standing here with an insecurity complex, but it's just like someone say amen to these powerful truths. Something has radically changed. You used to be dead, but now you've come alive. And for some of us here, Paul words... Paul's words really aptly describe how it has been for you as well. It was clearly a time before Christ and a time after Christ. And I must say, I, I came out of the womb as a Christian. There's, there's not really a time before Christ. It's, it's, I've always been an excited little boy in church and always had a sort of vision that I wanted to do something in this kingdom. I've not only always been a very holy, uh, <laughs> sinless, <laughs> blameless little man, but... Uh, 
I've always, I've always kind of known God and, and lived with Him. But I think there's many of us here, and I, and I love those stories, I love those testimonies, where there's so clearly a time before Christ and a time since Christ, since He stepped in, how something has so radically changed. And Paul uses the language of from death to life, not just to draw a contrast, not just to use strong words that we kind of understand the impact. He does that on purpose. Why? Because, well, because it's because of Christ's death and resurrection that we now have this grace. So it's not just strong words, like, be, like before you didn't know anything, before you were dead, but now you are alive. No, it's because we are in Christ, because with Christ, we also died and we also were resurrected. That's why Paul uses those phrasings, with Christ, in Christ. He seems to be saying, what has happened to Christ has now also happened to you through grace. You were dead, but now you are dead to sin and you are alive with Christ. Any of you watch the uh, Olympics? You can be honest, yeah. This is good, yeah, that's not... <laughs> yeah, like, my, all the time, like... <laughs> All the, like, uh, and I especially love those sports that you never watch, but then suddenly when the Olympics are on, you find them super important. You want to know who wins that sprint. You want to know who wins that one race, that one thing. And so one of the sports that I never watch, only at the Olympics, is judo. Anyone watches judo? Anything knows anything about judo? No? Tiny little bit? Yeah? And so I was watching a little bit of the... Of the judo, I know I have for for a while, you know, at the Olympics, and then one of the ways that you can win a fight in judo is through what is called a lock. Um, it's it's when the two fighters are are on the floor and the one holds the other in such a grip. One of the uh, like it's, uh, has, I think it has to do with the ligaments. So when you hold someone at least in such a lock that they're basically helpless, they cannot get out. With all the strength of the world, like they're trying to get out, but they just can't. When you do that, I think for over 10 seconds or something, then, then you win, you win the fight. This is maybe, an, um, like you see one of them here, like it's, it's it, you're basically helpless, you're trying to get out, but you're in this lock, something is holding you down, pinning you to the ground, and there's no way to get out. And this is really how sin had held us in the past in a sort of death lock. It's holding us down. We, I mean, it's not like we're, we have no strength, but it's just not enough to get out of that lock, not enough to, to get out in our own strength. It's just impossible. But then on the cross, Jesus took on a fight with the sin of the world and all of its consequences, and he died to it. And in this way, he broke the power of sin and liberated us from the death lock. It's like Jesus steps into the fight and says, hey, your, your fight is not with this person, it's with me. And so he, he's liberating us from the death lock. He's, ta- he's breaking the power of sin over us and says, your fight is now with me. From that defeated position, Jesus kind of saves us, breaks off the power of sin, and he takes on the fight in our place. And then gets even better, because through the resurrection, he's like throwing sin (laughs) in a a big throw to the floor on its back, Ippon fights over. Yeah, this is, this this technique is what's called a self-sacrificial technique, where you basically, you, you, you work the opponent to the ground by first going to the ground yourself and then throwing the other over. And this is really what Jesus has done on the cross. It's a self-sacrificial technique where he gives himself on the cross, but then through the resurrection throws the enemy uh, (laughs) over its back, pins the enemy to the ground, and the fight is over. This is what Jesus has done for us, for his breaking of the power of sin over us. And then taking on the fight and through a self-sacrificial technique, throws the enemy on the floor, breaking the power of sin over us completely and forever. And then Paul says, in Christ and with Christ, you have won that victory. You are victorious over sin. He did it, but you get to celebrate. He did it, but you get to give the post-match interview. 
And then Paul says, when you do that, when you give the post-match interview, and the interviewer asks you, how did you win this fight? What are you going to do? Are you going to boast? <laughs> are you going to say, oh, man, I was just so strong. I just saw that guy, like, threw him on his back, like, yeah. Like, no, you're going to testify, you know, Christ has won this fight for me. Like, I stand there as the victor. I stand there with the golden medal. But, but really, it's all Christ. He broke the power over me. Like, I was in a death lock. But he broke that power over He stepped into the fight. He broke that death lock over me. And then he threw that enemy on its back. And I, I get to stand there as the victory. But I, I've, I'm in no place to boast about anything. I'm just standing here with gratitude. Christ has done it for me. That's what's called a testimony. That's what's called a testimony. So we have a choice to make. And some of us have not made a choice yet. See, maybe you feel like you're in the death lock. You're in that lock and you're trying to move, you're trying to get out, but you're just not able to. I just want to invite you to consider, maybe it's time to tap out and say, Jesus, you take over because I cannot get out of this, this lock myself. I'm just helpless here. Give him my all strength, but sin is stronger. This, this, this evil that somehow resides in me, that it keeps on dragging me to the, to the, to the wrong things that are not from you, it's, it, it's stronger. But I know, Jesus, that you can do it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tap out of this fight. I'm going to let you take over and defeat this enemy for me. And unless you let go and let God, you will continue to struggle with your back pinned to the floor, unable to get out. So through grace, just back from the metaphor, back to the Bible language, <laughs> through grace we are completely renewed human beings. The way that Paul talks about grace, I mean, he used, I love this about Paul, and I'm discovering that more and more as I, I preach through stuff and as I read through stuff, how, how he uses basically anything from the Old Testament as a metaphor to explain what Christ has done. He uses the exile, he uses the, uh, the, the, the slavery in Egypt and the way out of that. He uses creation and new creation. He just uses anything that he can find in the Old Testament to explain, hey, this is, this is what grace is like, this is what he has done for you. And so the, now he's talking about a process of recreation. You are a new work of creation. You are a renewed human being. It's like he recreated you. And he says this, this final verse in the, in the uh, part one. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. So it's uh, like, a, like a recreation. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God uh, prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. See, three, through Jesus Christ, God is recreating this world. And his resurrection was like the start of a, of a new era, the dawn of a new age, the age to come. And everyone that receives this grace by faith experiences this same recreation. That's what it means to be alive with Christ. And so we are the workmanship of God. Who we are today, as people under grace, is the result of what God has done in our lives. And he uses the word workmanship here. In, in some other translations, you might find handiwork. In the New Living Translation, uh, masterpiece, it's everyone's favorite. Uh, <laughs> but you can really explain it in two ways that are kind of complementary to each other. The first one is, and it's, this is the dominant sort of meaning here, is that through the restorative power of grace, we are uh, today the result of his grace, of his, of his recreation. Like he, we are, who we are today is because of Christ. We are his workmanship. This is because of him. And then the second sort of in addition uh, meaning is that God is recreating us uniquely and beautifully. This is the masterpiece translation. It's the secondary sort of meaning but still something that's implied here, that he created us beautifully as a, as a masterpiece, as an artist, for a unique purpose, for the, for the good works that he has prepared for us. He has recreated you uniquely for his special purposes. And so in summary on this part, part one, as people under grace, 
We are the renewed humanity. In Christ, through his death and resurrection, we've become completely renewed people. We have come alive and we have been recreated. We have been set free from the death lock of sin to live a life for the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Once again, if this is something that you've not experienced yet, we want to we wanna help you this morning. We want to give you an opportunity to tap out of the fight that we know you can't win. Let Jesus take over and win the fight for you. We're ready to pray with you to accept Jesus, to put your faith in Jesus. All right, moving on to part two, the renewed people of God. I want to invite Rowana to read to do this scripture reading uh, with us, just to draw the... Just to, just to make clear that we're moving from part one to part two. This is the individual uh, experience of grace, but now we're moving to the more communal uh, experience of grace. And so I want to ask you, to, we're going to continue our morning gymnastics. I want to ask you to stand up <laughs> again for part two of the of scripture reading today. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, here's the... yeah. So I'll continue from uh, Ephesians 2.11. Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. You can be seated again. Yeah, and there's a good reason why I asked both of you ladies to do the scripture reading today because these are words that you've experienced in your lives uh, in such a powerful way. There's scripture coming alive also in your, your testimony. So thank you for this power in your reading uh, today because of that. So thank you so much. Ah. The implications of grace far transcend the individual experience. And I always find it so sad when churches cannot but just look at the individual experience of grace and what Christ has done for you and how you were in your sins, but how you are alive in Christ and that how God is for you and not against you. And all. It's always talking about you in a, in a singular form, but really... So often the Bible is talking about you in the, in the plural sense, you as a church community. And so it's so important to move also from, hey, this is what grace has done in your life, singular, but now let's move on to what grace means in you at a more communal level, at, at the church level. Because through grace, God has formed a renewed people for himself, and that is the church. Through the cross, Jesus broke down the existing hostility between people groups. And Paul applies that here to the Jews and the Gentiles. And of course, it was very relevant in the early church because Christianity I mean, came out of, of Judaism. Jesus was a Jew and his first followers were all Jews. And the whole history of God's revelation was to the people of Israel. But now it's for the nations. And so God is forming a renewed people to himself in the church, existing in both Jew and Gentile. But there was an equality there that is addressed in many of the letters of Paul. Um, but that inequality is sort of broken down. Like we are all um, 
under the, under the grace of God, and God is forming a, a new people to himself, with Jesus as the cornerstone, and a, and a people where people can, uh, uh, a people group where individuals can come into the presence of God, into the family of God, and really feel at home. See, when God first called Abraham and started his journey with the people of Israel, his intention was to set them apart so that they could be a blessing to the whole world, so that God could um, sort of bring back the nations to himself through the people of Israel. But throughout the whole of the Old Testament, you see that all the surrounding nations have a hostility against them. Remember, if you, if you read through Genesis uh, um, like the, the final 10 chapters or so are the story of Joseph. You even see there, like the Egyptians, they did not want to sit down with Hebrews because they, they were disgusted by them. Just this sort of, like, why? They, just, they were just disgusted by them. There's this hostility. There's this, this despising of, of these people. And later, of course, that turned into oppression and into attack. And this happened again and again with the Babylonians and the Assyrians. This happened again with the Greeks as they ruled uh, over the land. This happened with the Romans. They, in some way, were just put off by these people. Of course, this is not something that stopped after the time of Jesus. This is something that's stained history even to, to this day. God's intention was to win back the nations to himself through the people of Israel. But you see this hostility against these people, perhaps for this very same reason. But in Jesus, Jesus fulfills the destiny of Israel as the Messiah, as their Savior, but also as the Savior of the world. And so he fulfills that destiny of Israel, and through Jesus then, God redeems the, the people, he brings back the nations to himself and reconciles people to himself and to each other. Now, this was a highly significant theme for the early Christians, for the early church. It's not so much attention that we experience today, but we do have this sense that now that we now belong to a new people of God. We are part of a new kingdom, and anything that would have separated us in the past now is subjected to the unity of um, to unity in King Jesus. And this is why I also love being the pastor of an international church as we are sitting here with people from all over the world. People from all kinds of different church communities, different cultural backgrounds, different languages, different colors, different customs. It's somehow completely united because we all wholeheartedly say Jesus is Lord. How beautiful is that? And so age and race and education and political preference and nationality and language and history and personality and the stages of life or your social status, your living conditions, whatever, these things are not things that will separate us anymore, that will sort of be in the way of a unity because we are all serving the same king. All of these things are just secondary or or. How do you say that? Third importance. <laughs> These are all subjected now to our unity in Christ Jesus. Right, back again to the Olympics. One of the things that all the Dutch people, in some way, I don't know how exactly, were really looking forward to was the 400 meter hurdles for women. Unclear why, perhaps because the Dutchie was doing really well. I think that was it. So, <laughs> the four, the, super random, the 400 hurdles for women. Who is the fastest around the track with, I don't know how many, 12 uh, hurdles to, to jump over for women? And it's because of uh, one lady, this one on the left, that's Femke Bol. She's from Amersfoort, she's young, and she's really good. She had that amazing sprint at a mixed relay that we're all super excited about. But this was her, this was going to be her race, because she is really good at 400 meter hurdles. But so is this other lady, that's uh, Sydney, Sydney McLaughlin Levron. She is actually the former Olympic champion and also the world record holder. Uh, but so there was going to 
going to be this clash between these two ladies. And it was such a, uh, so hyped that even on our guys' night that we had organized, we ended <laughs> the night by watching the <laughs> women's 400-meter hurdles because it was going to be epic. <laughs> it's funny. It's maybe because I have a thing for sports. Funny thing, though, was we were discussing even beforehand, who should we cheer for here? Because my, my Dutchness says, yeah, the one that speaks my language, the one that's dressed in orange, the one that's from the city I was born in, of course, we're going to cheer for her. But then this one, this lady, I mean, it's not like the US needed any more gold medals, but <laughs> just, uh, they did quite well. Uh, so did we. Here you go, G GB, we beat you this time. <laughs> uh, and uh, never again, probably. But, so, but she, she's a Christian. She's not just a, like, like, I believe in God, thank you, but more like she's a wholehearted testifying Christian that even wrote a book about her testimony coming out of the darkness sort of, of anxiety of a, of a top athlete that she really suffered under and found Jesus and has this amazing testimony of what God has done in her life. She even said, like, I'm so privileged that I don't just get to represent the USA, I get to represent the kingdom of God. I'm going, yeah. That's cool. So then, like, who should I cheer for here? The one that's in orange or the one that, you know, gives all glory to King Jesus? And so I decided I can cheer for both. <laughs> and I'll win either way. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, the, the American won by a landslide, but that's not important now. <laughs> Now, when it comes to sports, these are all minor things. These are ultimately unimportant things, at least when you don't get all riled up into, into sports, when you can just enjoy it for entertainment. But that unity, that belonging together in one people, that the dividing wall of hostility that's broken down between us, ooh, that's tested at a whole different a level when your people group and the other people group where there's also Christians have a long history of hate and war and conflict and stuff like that. That's tested at a whole different level. Even today, I think we're here with people from countries that are at war with each other or that have at least a, a long history of pain and suffering and hate towards each other. And I think the power and the testimony of the church is best seen when it ignores these man-made divides and embraces brothers and sisters on the other side of that wall of hostility. And in Jesus' name, together we can continue to break down these walls. And so if you're just in this church and you're part of this community and you know you're going to spend some time with us, perhaps in the coming years, can I just challenge you to connect to people that are completely different from you? I mean, it's something that does happen. Like, we, we all get, we're all worshiping the name of Jesus together, but ultimately, relationally, it's easiest to connect to people that look like you and sound like you and think like you and just are a little bit less familiar. It's easier, it's quicker. But can I just challenge you? Like, try to make that effort, because these are all unconscious things that happen. It's not, you know, try to make that effort to, to connect more with people that are just different, look different, like are from a completely different cultural background, just pray different, believe different, and there's so much that we can learn from each other. There's, there's, there's different uh, gifts of grace that he has given, also to our different chur uh, uh, church backgrounds, like you might be from a charismatic background, you might be from a more reformed background or whatever in between, there's a special grace on these different church backgrounds or cultural backgrounds that are just enriching when, they, when, when we bring them together and when we learn from each other and we don't just become a, an English-speaking church but truly an international church. And so God is forming us into a spiritual home. This reunited family of God is a spiritual home. As Paul says it, in him you also are being built together into a dwelling place. It's, it's tabernacle language. A dwelling place for God by the Spirit. 
I think this is one of our main tasks as a church community. It's in the midst of this divided world, in the midst of this confused world, to in unity be a dwelling place for God. God's presence is in his people and it's with his people through the Holy Spirit. And our main job in this world is as the church to be a place that that is hosting the presence of God. I hope that's something that I'm praying that that's something that we can really grow in in this coming year is to host the presence of God and together kind of find out what that even means. (laughs) So that people that are currently far away from him can encounter him just by stepping into this building. This is also why every Sunday we are praying at our pre-service prayer meeting, nine o'clock in the classroom there. Lord, make this a dwelling place. Make this your dwelling place. Come, Holy Spirit, move among us. We're hungry for your presence. See, these are prayers that are not just, Lord, give us a fun Sunday where we just feel alive and have energy for the rest of the week. No, it, it means... Look, we want to be a dwelling place where people can have a a life-changing encounter with you, where they can go from death to life in Jesus' name. That's what we want. We want to see the the kingdom of God manifest among us. We want to be a place where the presence of God is so thick and so noticeable, so tangible, that no one, Christian or not yet Christian, can deny that the living God is here among us. Lastly, all of this has one really big condition hanging over it. It's a good condition, but it's a condition. (laughs) It's under the condition that Jesus is the cornerstone. Yeah? It's it got this sense like unless sort of the Lord is building the house, the laborers are building in vain. It's like unless Jesus is the cornerstone, that house will just topple over as soon as the wind blows and the rain comes. Like Jesus needs to be I'm mixing biblical metaphors here, (laughs) like you wouldn't believe, I'm sorry. When the Bible describes the church, uh, 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 Paul compares it here to a a, a body, and then he calls Jesus the head, and then he compares it to a building, and he calls Jesus the cornerstone. Jesus needs to be front and center to everything that we do. And churches and people, we get so distracted by side business, things that are ultimately unimportant. We look at the forms and we look at the methods and we look at the programs, we look at the style and we look at the language. All of these things, important as they may be, can never be our main focus. The main focus is Jesus who is the head, Jesus who is the cornerstone, Jesus who is at the very center of this church. And with Je- <laughs> Thank you guys. And with Jesus as the focus of our attention and worship, with the name of Jesus as, as a banner that's, that's waving over our church, as a united people of God gathered from all around the world, I believe that nothing is impossible. And I believe also that in this coming year, in this coming season, we're going to experience that a lot more, that nothing is impossible because God wants to do something in our midst. I believe that. And so I want to call you also to prayer for that. Call you to prayer like, This sense of hunger that's continuing. Like before summer, we were talking about cultivating a hunger for God. That's not just a sermon series that's for that time, for that month. That's for like from here on out, we're going to continue to hunger for the presence of God. We're going to look forward to what he's going to do in this church. Because people are returning to the Lord. Yes, also in the West. People are returning to the Lord and we need to get ready. And so we better make sure that Jesus is at the center, that Jesus is at the heart of this. There's a story in the Bible where there's a the worship, team, uh, worship team, you can get, uh, get, get back up, you can take your iPad, um, where, where there's this, this, I've used this before in a message, but it just comes to mind now, where there's this woman who's been sick for 20 or 30, for, for a really long time, and she's been bleeding, and she's, you know, uh, um, um, unholy, and no one can touch her, and she needs to be away. And and in desperation, she breaks all the rules by moving through a crowd just to touch the robe of Jesus, because she, she has this sense, like perhaps, like he might heal me. Perhaps if, if I just get that close to him, if I get to touch him, that he will heal me. And um, 
that happens, she touches him, she's healed. He kind of calls her out and kind of confirms her faith, prays her for that. And I think that in some way that's, that's a metaphor. Like we've got people like that coming into our church. People that just have a desperation, like, I don't know what else to do, but perhaps if I just step into this place, perhaps if, perhaps they have the truth, perhaps they have the real life, perhaps they have the answers that I've been looking for all my life. Perhaps they have the cure for, for whatever this illness is. You've got people like that coming into our church as well. And we better make sure... <laughs> As the community, as, as the renewed people of God, as a community of believers, we better make sure that what they encounter when they come to church is Jesus Christ and nothing or no one else. They need to encounter Jesus. And so what we, what we proclaim and, and what we testify of and, and just the, the, the presence that we're hosting is the presence of Jesus. This, this church is to be about nothing else than Jesus, he needs to be at the center. Anyone that walks in, however much sort of pre-knowledge they have, if they've ever touched or read a Bible, doesn't matter. They need to understand, just based on the Sunday morning, it's all about Jesus here. And they get to encounter Jesus, and they get to experience that resurrection power of Jesus. Amen? That's what we're going to be about. All right, let's stand to our feet and get ready to worship. Jesus Christ, we're so thankful that we can just say your name with this reverence, with this awe, with this, with this excitement. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus the Christ. Jesus the Messiah. Jesus the King. Jesus the Savior. Jesus the Lord. Jesus the Cornerstone. Jesus the Head of the Body. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. The one that died and was raised alive again. Firstborn of the new creation, continuing to recreate this world until he comes again to make all things new. Jesus, Jesus, we love you and we worship you. And I pray that everyone in this church, everyone in this city, everyone in this country and continent will one day just proclaim your name with that same sense of reverence. Everyone knows the power of the name of Jesus, but not everyone says his name with love and with reverence. That will change. Because one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. That he, they will come to an acknowledgement that Jesus is who he says he is. Whether admitting that they were wrong, or confirming, celebrating that they saw this and they experienced this in their lives. Lord, I pray that you will use us as a church community to gather people to yourself from every nation, from every background, for whatever circumstances, conditions they're in, however far away they are from you currently or perhaps however close, and we don't even know it. I pray that you will use us as a church community and prepare us as a church community to welcome people into the family of God, to welcome people into the, the dwelling place of God, making sure that what they will encounter here is indeed Jesus Christ, no one else, nothing else. Thank you for what you've done in our lives. So we're standing here. I thank you for how you are still forming and every year reforming this church community with new faces, with new testimonies. Lord, we just as we're still at the sort of start of a new season, Lord, we just want to submit that to you and say, Lord, have your way with us. Have your way with me. What you want to do in my life, with my, the questions that I'm bringing, with, the, with um, the doubts perhaps that I'm bringing, with the, the history that I'm bringing. Have your way in me as well. Speak to me. 
guide me, move me. <laughs> Lord, we come into a new year with this sense of expectation that you're going to do something new and refreshing also in our church community. We want to host your presence. Not only because we are coming alive in your presence and we just love being with you, but also because we know that we get to host your presence for the sake of others so that they can encounter you. So I just pray that you will touch our hearts to be continually in love with you, hungering after you, desperate for your presence. So that with vision, we can just enter into this new year. Make you the focus of our lives. Make you the focus of our church. Amen.